So we're looking this morning at where does righteousness begin? Because there are some varying opinions about where it begins, but hopefully once we study a little bit, we're going to have a better idea of exactly where we can go to to find the kind of righteousness that we want to have. This topic took me back to when I was a little girl and thinking about a time I went to go visit my grandmother. And my grandmother, she was quite the baker. She could make it all. Could your grandma do that? Right? They, they just had a way. They didn't have to measure. They didn't have to think about it. They just did it, and it was the best. That was what she did. And so she was going to teach me how to bake. And she would take her time, and she would slowly explain everything to me. She explained all the mixing and the spacing and um, how to put it in the oven the right way. And the, my favorite thing to eat or make was chocolate chip cookies. They're, that's my favorite food group, I think. But the finishing touch on the chocolate chip cookies is you take four chocolate chips after the, the, they're all rolled out and placed down, and you put four chocolate chips on the top. And then when they bake, they're supposed to come out just perfectly pretty because we take the first bite with our eyes, right? We see it, and it looks good, and then we want to eat more, right? Maybe I should quit putting chocolate chips on top of the <laughs> cookies. Maybe I'd eat less. It came time after all of the instruction that she gave me that it was, I got to make my own batch. She said, okay, it's your turn. I've given you everything you need to know. You have the instructions. You have the recipe. You know what to do. You know how to put them out on the pan. I put my first batch in the oven. I was pretty proud. Now, there's something to that um, verse that says a haughty spirit goes before the fall. <laughs> that was about to happen to me, but I was excited. My first batch is going in, and I thought, I'm the next greatest cook in the family. This is it. It's my time to shine. Well, I watched those cookies, and instead of them turning into cookies, they just spread, and they spread, and they spread until it was just eventually one big cookie sheet full of cookies full of a cookie. Now, it was a tasty blob, but it didn't look good. We're supposed to take the first bite with our eyes. I didn't want to eat it. It just, it didn't appeal to me. And she just laughed. She saw that I was humiliated about the entire process, but she chuckled, which wasn't like her. And so I said, what did I do wrong? She saw my disappointment, didn't try to make me feel better. Thanks, Grandma. She said, you had everything that you needed. You had all the ingredients, and you had all the steps down, and I gave you the best instruction that I knew how to give you, but you didn't follow the instructions. You didn't follow them like you were supposed to. At the time, it was, you know, made me feel bad. I felt like I'd wasted her time. I felt like I'd, I'd wasted uh, the money for the cookies. There was so much that I felt like I had done wrong, and I was beating myself up for it. But she was teaching me an important lesson with this baking lesson that she gave. She taught a lesson about persistence and patience, precision, and most importantly, following instructions. So we had wasted some ingredients, but the way that she taught me that day, do you think that I have ever forgotten again about spacing cookies out the right way? No. She let me learn in such a way she let me learn in a way she knew I would understand. She took time to know me and teach me. That's a special gift when you have somebody like that. And sometimes it's not a grandmother that's like that to you. Sometimes it's, it's an aunt or a friend or a lady in the congregation who kind of takes you under her wing. But maybe there's somebody that's helped take you in and teach you things. My grandma gave the best kind of instruction, but she didn't just teach about baking cookies. She taught me a lot more than that. I knew what kind of cook she was, how diligent she was, how clean she was. After everything was a wreck, she would have it all tidied up in no time. I could count on her knowing so much. I could go to her and ask her any question, and she'd have the answer for me. She didn't have to Google it, because I didn't have that. She, she had to use her brain. <laughs> I don't do that. Got everything printed out in front of me. She was sincerely invested in her cooking, 
and even more sincere about the instructions that she passed on to us, except for there was one in particular, opera cream fudge. I don't know if you have heard of it or not, but I think she thought it was pretty funny to leave out one of the ingredients because my sister-in-law and I spent hours and hours trying to make that and we never could. So she, uh, she left us chuckling a little bit too when she left us an incomplete recipe. We think about grandmothers and women that are influential in our lives. Paul wrote a letter to Timothy and he had something to say about a grandmother and a mother. He told him in 2 Timothy 3.14, he said, but continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So an apostle meets a young man whose father's not in the picture, at least not the picture that we are given. And he tells him to continue in what he learned from these two women, Lois and Eunice. So do you think there's a chance that at any given moment when Timothy was growing up during Bible time or in worship or in teaching Timothy the importance of good behavior, because we have to do that, right? That any of the three might have thought, I can't do this. This boy is wearing me out. I haven't slept in days. He, I haven't heard a sermon in six years. You ever feel that way? Maybe one of them thought, this is a waste of my time. Maybe... Lois thought, he's not listening to anything that I say, or I didn't show him how to do that in the best way, and then she thinks about what she should have done, or I lost my temper. That never happens, though, right? We don't ever lose our tempers on our children, and we beat ourselves up for that. I didn't react right to that, and then we think maybe we aren't qualified to be doing this job. But ladies, there's nobody more qualified than you to be instructing the people in your home in righteousness. We can't let frustrations and hurdles hold us back like that. No, you, they're not going to win all the Bible bowls. That doesn't mean that you didn't review everything good enough for them. They're not going to win. They're not going to place in all of the lads competitions that there are going on last week. It's not going to happen. And we think about what Paul didn't say. He, he didn't say continue in the things which these two flawless women taught you perfectly in every single way and you did everything just right, just like they said. That's not what Paul shared. Paul said keep doing the things that they taught you and don't forget who taught you. Not just your grandmother and your mother, but who are these women? Not just mom and grandma, but remember who they are, the kind of women that they are. Paul did say in 2 Timothy 1.5, he said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that in thee also, he was persuaded that Timothy also had this sincere faith. The way that Timothy was taught, it wasn't about being done perfectly and without any setbacks or maybe a temper tantrum here or there, but it was about teaching with absolute sincerity and not just in sitting down and, and looking at a book and teaching that way, but teaching an example in an every facet. Paul didn't hesitate to give honor to whom honor is due when he talked about Lois and Eunice. He introduced his second letter to Timothy concerning the upbringing that he received from these two women. And not just the upbringing, but the faith that they had. It was notable. It was worth recording in the Holy Word. Paul says that Timothy's faith is unfeigned. I didn't know my clicker quit. Let's try to get this going. All right. Paul said Timothy's faith was unfeigned. In the Greek, the word is anupokritos. That sounds like hypocrisy. I mean, it's, it's unhypocritical. It is sincere and genuine. It is not the kind of faith that says, do as I say and not as I do. 
It is the kind of faith that says you can mimic me in any way when it comes to my faith. It's a faith that doesn't come about by accident, but it comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Even at Timothy's young age, he was displaying attributes and qualities that were not common just for any young person. You ever met a young person like that where you're just astounded at how kind they are and the good things that they do for you and you appreciate it so much? It's like this young person really took it to heart who they needed to be and how they want to serve God. Those young people that are uh, acting this way, it doesn't happen by accident. It's because of attentive and intentional and persistence in all the teaching and in faithful mothers and fathers or somebody faithful in their life that's teaching them. How many mothers do we have in here? Okay. All right. Here's the exciting one. How many grandmothers do we have in here? <gasps> it's exciting. How many of you have some kind of interaction with a young person that you can influence? Okay. So this can be for anyone, right? It's not just about mothers and grandmothers. By the time Luke introduces um, Timothy upon Paul's return to Lystra during the second missionary journey, Timothy already had a good report from the brethren that were there. And um, that's Acts 16 and verse 2. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. That's our Timothy. This was the son of a certain woman, a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. Now, as far as his father goes, we don't have any other information about him. We can't make too many assumptions about him. We just know that that was the only thing that was left for us to know. But we also know that this mother and this grandmother that were both mentioned by name, they had the kind of son and grandson that they got to hear. They had bragging rights about. You like that, right? Bragging rights? Tell all about all the good things that are happening in your family and um, the grandkids. It's exciting, especially when the grandkids come along. That's when the pictures really start popping up. And so then your grandchild gets a compliment. Boy, he's a, he's a servant. He, you know, when we're having a potluck, he opens up the door for all the ladies, bringing in all the crock pots. He goes out to the car, he carry them in. He's just, he's amazing. How did you get him to do that? He stacks those chairs perfectly after every single fellowship meal. He's going, hey, he's just, he's definitely going to heaven if he can stack those chairs, right? That's a sure sign. He's bringing people to worship. He's saving souls. He's, he's one of the few. On Saturdays, he goes out by himself looking for doors to knock so that he can bring a soul to Christ. Whatever Timothy's actions were, we don't know exactly what they were, but they stood out. He was a standout of a young man. So what makes this even more notable is that Timothy's mother is a believing Jewess and his father is a Greek. And they are raising him in a pagan place, pagan worship. This was not a place that we would think about wanting to raise a family. They were surrounded by it. We don't know anything about Timothy's father. Maybe he left because uh, maybe it was desertion. Maybe it was divorce. Maybe he died. Maybe he just really wasn't worth mentioning again. But regardless of the situation with that, Paul saw this young man as being equipped for the service in the Lord's church based on his faith and the instruction that had been instilled in him from those two women. Paul saw Timothy's faith, but before that, he saw it in women responsible for guiding him in that faith. They taught him what he needed to know. These women understood the value of engrafting the word of God. They understand how powerful it is. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. But you have to wonder, or at least I wonder, 
as a little boy, what was he like? You know, he grew up, and we've got all kinds of good things recorded about him, but do you think Timothy was maybe a little mischievous, a little strong-willed? Maybe um, told him to give his brother's toy back, and he went to the toilet and flushed it like one of mine did. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> or was he a 35-year-old man trapped in a 4-year-old's body who was hard to teach anything because he already thought he knew everything? Was he like that? Or was he more like that stereotypical firstborn child that is just a pleaser? He minds all the P's and all the Q's and does it just right. And he's so smart and everybody brags on him. He never needs scolded. He never needs a spanking. He's just that kid, you know. We don't know what personality type Timothy had. And it didn't matter. Whatever kind of person he was, whatever kind of child he was, these women took time to guide him and instruct him in righteousness. They taught him how he could be right with God, and that's what righteousness is, being in a right state with God. They showed him that the man of God, they showed him that the man of God, only by the word of God, can be perfect or complete, as 2 Timothy 3.17. Their faith could be seen in them as individuals and what Paul exhorts them in their faith and what's seen in their home. They didn't have a certain faith or a certain face when they gathered with the church. They were the same when they were out and they were the same when they walked back through the door when they got home. It's been interesting here lately. We've had young people coming forward a lot and it's wonderful. So thankful that they're examining themselves. But something that is repeatedly said and that they want to repent of and make things right is wearing the mask, being different people. So ladies, how often are we wearing a mask and being different than who we are when we're standing up and teaching in front of people and when we're at home and angry and bitter and crying our eyes out and being mean to everybody? Are we wearing a mask, or are we who we need to be? Do we have an unfeigned faith, or do we have a fake faith? Are we wearing a mask, or are we just wearing Christ? It wasn't a Sunday-only kind of faith that these ladies had. It wasn't a Sunday, twice-a-day, Wednesday kind of faith that these ladies had. It wasn't a Sunday, Wednesday, and every extra activity kind of faith these ladies had. Theirs was faith in the home that was the Deuteronomy 6 kind of faith. I'll get caught up sometime on this. You know what this says. Moses instructing Israel on how they're to instruct their homes. The faithfulness that Timothy was taught. They were to be taught when they were sitting in their house, walking by the way, lying down and rising back up, and then the next day they were going to do it all over again. This was the kind of faith that they had. And when they started teaching him, they didn't get frustrated because he didn't listen to everything and throw in the towel. They didn't give up. But they couldn't have done this they couldn't have stuck to it, and they couldn't have had a sincere faith if they hadn't first had the faith in them. Are we fully convinced that if we love the Lord with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind, that we won't have to be begged or badgered to study memory verses and quiz cards with our children? Or have we convinced ourselves that only teaching a series of facts and just teaching them to be able to point things out or open to a book in the Bible is what faith looks like? Is that all Paul meant when he said unfeigned faith? Just to be able to teach facts and not instill in them a true desire for righteousness. What about our families today? How can we as women as influencers of faith in the church, whatever your role looks like. Is it unfeigned? That genuine, sincere belief that God 
uh, that a belief in God leads to a righteous life. And where does a life that looks like that, where does that even begin? Does it begin with our nation? Does it begin in the White House? We know the answer to that. Where does instruction and righteousness begin? It begins first and foremost where it's always been, where it began. It's in heaven. The same inspired apostle who recruited and personally mentored Timothy in his missions program, he explained the foundation of righteousness and where it begins. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10.10. 10. Believeth in this verse is pistuo, and it means to have faith in. Thayer says it's to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit or place confidence in. Faith isn't the finish line, but it's the starting line that leads to the ultimate goal, which is our salvation. Faith isn't the finish line, but it's, it starts. It's our starting point. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the gospel that the child of God and the children in our homes, they should find the righteousness of God therein. Because his righteous nature is the ultimate declaration of who he is. Remember, my grandma wasn't just a cook. She was who she was because of the, the way that she invested in things. Lois and Eunice were not just good grandma and mom because they didn't yell or because they didn't boss people around or nag dad. They, are, they have an unfeigned faith and they believe that leads to righteousness because they know who God is and they know they want to mimic his qualities and his attributes. Children don't automatically understand who God is. We tell them facts. They can repeat them back to us by the time they're two or under. And that's a great thing. But if they get stuck at the age of two and never know anything besides the facts, and they don't know the love and the kindness and the mercy and the grace and the justice of God, then we may have missed the point. You can see it in how moms live. Sometimes you can see it in your own life. You can see it in how they love and how they interact with their families behind closed doors. This is the, this picture of God's attributes is exactly what the model mothers in Timothy's life imparted to their precious boy. They gave him their best. I don't know what your thoughts were when you found out you were expecting or when you found out you were going to have a grandbaby. Maybe it was the greatest news you'd ever received. Maybe it was a big shock to you. And maybe <laughs> you had a five-month-old at home and found out you had another one on the way and you cried your eyes out. Whatever the response <laughs> was your response. But what did you do once you had that precious soul in your care? Did you help with the unfeigned faith? Did you show the unfeigned faith? What about today? What do children see at home when it's just mom and dad? How does mom treat dad, whether he's a Christian or not? It can be awfully easy, especially if he's unfaithful or if he, uh, he's just not a member at all. It can be awfully easy to be pretty snarky about him and throw him under the bus because you know he's not doing right, and if he were smarter, he would be doing right, and so you can put him in his place even when he's not around, right? Is that unfeigned faith? How does Mima treat Papa? Those aren't names we use in my family, but I've heard people do it. Anybody a Mima or a Papa? <laughs> we don't have any Papas in here. Get out. No. <laughs> does, does this grandmother save all of her smiles for everybody else out in public and then just demean her husband at home? Or does she possess the human-like character traits used by God to describe how he interacts with his creation. Who God is. God tells us who he is. In Exodus chapter 34, 
<laughs> he makes it really clear to Moses. Moses is up on the mountain. He's having his meeting with the Lord, and Moses wants to know God. He wants to know more about him. He's already spent quite a bit of time with him, but he still wants to know more. And so God gives him a description. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and the transgression and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. The standard for God's righteousness begins in heaven because that's where God is. And he is the standard for righteousness because he is righteousness. Everything about God is right. All of his qualities. He doesn't make mistakes. There are no accidents. Imagine God looking down upon his creation. And he sees all of these people that profess to be his children. But he only knows those who are as he is. They are righteous. 1 John 1, 29 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. Does God know who his children are? He certainly does. He's the one who set the standard, and he exhibits every good and great quality that man can ever attain, who we can ever hope to become. And he offers us the opportunity to exhibit some of those same qualities by sampling and strive, striving to be like him, not just for a little while and then giving up because, hey, I didn't do so great last week. It was really bad. But picking back up where you left off and making the most of it and letting him make the most of you. Because if we stay in our ruts and we beat ourselves up, then he can't use us like he wants to. And why would we rob God like that of our service and our hearts? We can know if we're striving to be like him. We can know if, if we're showing mercy, Matthew 5, 7, we're trying to be like him. If we're letting our minds be on him and not on me, 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 Romans 12, 1, if we're constantly have, renewing our minds, we're trying to be like him. If we're sincere, 2 Corinthians 6, 6. If we're exhibiting those traits of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 20 through 24. Ephesians 4, 2, if we're showing patience. That one's not always easy, is it? Ephesians 5, 9, by being as much like our heavenly Father as is humanly possible. Colossians 3, 12, to be kind, humble, and meek. 1 Peter 1, 15, to be holy as he is holy. These qualities aren't about how good I am, what I'm doing. Look at me. We're not Pharisees, right? But it is about comparing ourselves to the standard that is set in heaven. It's about aligning my attitude and my personality, and that's really what the fruit of the Spirit is. It starts in here. And it shows without. It does not stay bottled up with a mask on and come out and be nice just when out in public. This is about having a right relationship with God and being righteous. He supplied us with all the instructions that we need, all the ingredients, if you will. He's given us all of the details in helping other souls be righteous too. From going the wrong way to getting right to being righteous he truly desires a relationship with his children do we see him that way do we see him as the friend that he talks about being he truly desires a relationship with his children and not just a you better do as i say kind of relationship he really wants to be our friend a righteous god doesn't treat his children an unrighteous God doesn't treat his children like a deadbeat dad that's not involved in their lives. A righteous God is very involved in the lives of his children. A righteous father is very involved in the lives of his children. So if we as Christian mothers and grandmothers and influencers hope to instruct our children in righteousness and impart godly examples of faith unfeigned to our children, we need to know what that looks like. 
Righteousness begins in heaven because that's where the standard began. It started, it didn't have a beginning because God's always been. Having children who just go to church or attend worship every chance that they get, they win all the lads awards, they get excited about those mission trips and they sign up for those. But if they never really learn about who God is and strive to become more and more like him, then all of those little bonus features are for nothing if they are not developing a faith unfeigned, a sincere and genuine faith. But that's not the kind of faith that we can instill in them if we don't have it. That's not the kind of faith that we can instill in the children in our Bible classes if we're not truly putting God's word into our heart, what kind of teacher are we? Are we sitting there and reading out of a book? Or are we engaging and getting them to answer and trying to get them to see how exciting it is to learn about God? Or is it just another Wednesday night that you wish you weren't teaching because you had a long day? Been there. <laughs> don't want to keep being that and don't want to do that. Instruction in righteousness is set in heaven because he who is the very definition of righteousness, he sits on a throne there. Do we know him? Who is he? Knowing God can only occur when righteousness begins in our heart. Her children rise up and call her blessed, Proverbs 31, 28. Sometimes others may even tell her children, you sure are blessed to have a mama like that. She's so nice and she always treats us so well when we come over. We really love your mom. Paul would not have brought up bad memories um, to Timothy if his grandmother and mother hadn't been good to him. Eunice and her mother Lois must have uh, valued their relationship with Timothy. It wasn't one that as he became a young man that they started to burn bridges because, hey, even though he's coming into 16, 17, and 18, I've got to boss him around all the time. Because if that's our attitude to these young men and young women that are coming into these upper ages, they're going to fight back. <laughs> they need us to start giving them some slack, but continue to teach them faithfully and determinedly that God is righteous and that they can be like that too. The nurturing, the training, and the loving that they offered to Timothy, it prepared his heart and it made him ready to receive the instruction in righteousness. If we're not maintaining a relationship with these children as they get older and older, are they going to want to hear anything that's said about God or the Bible or anything else pertaining to the religion or the church? We've got to be working on our relationship skills. And if we're working on our relationship skills with the Father, guess what other relationships are going to be affected? Every single one of them. There's not a relationship that won't be touched when you grow your relationship with God. When these two mothers cultivated in young Timothy's uh, desire to learn a knowledge of God and a service to God, they created rich soil ready for the word to be planted. And he was going to be great, and he was great. And he did wonderful things for the Lord, and he, he was determined. It was a scary time that Timothy was going to be serving at, and that's why Paul took time to write two letters to him and gave him warnings about what he was going to be facing. These ladies had righteousness in their hearts. They knew righteousness began in heaven, and they knew that in order for righteousness to begin in the heart, that it takes love. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the end of the commandment is charity. Now this is the agape love. This is the love that is a decision. It's a choice. I love you because I think you're worth it. I've decided to love you. It's not just some fanciful feeling. This is a, I love you. You're my sister in Christ. I love you. I see you pop up places all over, and I love her. And <laughs> but it's not just because you give me good feelings. I really, I've chosen to love you. This is the type of love that's a choice. It is purposeful. 
Jesus tried to teach that tempting lawyer about this kind of love, but it was kind of lost on him. In Luke 10, 27, Jesus told him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, and with all of thy soul, and all of thy mind, and the neighbor as thyself. And that well-educated lawyer, he just didn't get it. But these two women, they got it. They didn't have to be, they didn't have to be um, berated or belittled to learn what it was that they needed to learn. And they didn't have to be overly educated to learn what they needed to learn, to be instructed in righteousness and to instruct in righteousness. It was a job made for them. They provided for their boy, and it was out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, 1 Timothy 1.5. There's no doubt that their faith helped instruct Timothy, but they didn't allow the filth and the filkleness and the faithlessness to come between them and their goal to instruct Timothy in all the ways of righteousness to teach them all the things that they had built their own faith on. There wasn't room for any of those things in the hearts of his mother and grandmother, and there shouldn't be a place in our hearts for it either. When God rules in our hearts, we can have a pure and a clean heart, and we can have a good conscience. We remember that God has set a standard for what's right and wrong and what's moral and immoral. That's not a question we have to ask. He's, he's laid those things out for us already. This good conscience is not just a little cricket that sits on the shoulder and tells you what to do and what not to do. You've seen that one, right? How'd that go? <laughs> not great. That's not what the conscience is. The conscience, a true conscience, a good conscience is trained by the word of God. It is structured by the word of God, molded, and when that happens, it's ready to be exercised. A pure heart and a good conscience combine to reveal a heart that is sincere, that unfeigned faith. It's genuine as it can be, and it just drips off of the lady that has it. This faith doesn't talk out of both sides of the mouth saying one thing about spiritual topics to Sister Susie and uh, talk, go and talk to Brother Bo about having... Uh, behaving in an entirely different, inappropriate way at home. All for little Sally to overhear. Is Sally learning an unfeigned faith, or is she learning, I can be one person here and another person there? Righteousness begins in heaven with God because it begins with his standard. It's always been there. It's his personality, and righteousness begins in the heart. It begins in the heart of the one teaching and soon it'll be in the heart of the one who's learning. Knowing that righteousness begins first and foremost in heaven, we know that we can trust it. We know that it's righteousness that will make us right with God. And when taught righteousness, it absolutely begins in the heart. And yes, and instruction in righteousness should begin in our homes as well. That's not something we can afford to neglect. Righteousness also begins in our home. Not knowing what happened to Timothy's Greek father, it may be the case that Eunice is a single mother's success story. And those do exist. But she had help from her mother, but she didn't necessarily get help all day, every day from her. Don't know if they lived together or if she lived a few houses down. Eunice was a unique lady with a unique faith, and she instructed her son, not by mere words, but in deeds so that he could have the same blessing of having that unfeigned faith. Eunice was a lady who had the love Paul described in 1 Timothy 1.5. She had that pure heart, the kind that can't be bought or smeared on like makeup that just gets wiped off. This was not a mother who had any reason to beat herself up for setting a bad example to her son and yelling over those dishes that piled up in the sink again or losing her mind when the Bible verses didn't get memorized right. When the socks get mismatched, how you respond to that one? Or my personal favorite, those wet clothes in the dryer, that one really bothered. That one, if you're going to set me off, that's going to be it. When I open it up and smell mildew, that's it. Got to pray for me before I go open the dryer. Eunice could have a good conscience on how she was raising Timothy. Were there mistakes made? You better believe it. But they kept moving forward. 
She didn't drive herself into a corner of gloom and doom, neglecting her motherly duties because she didn't do so well the day before. Eunice was a woman who knew that instruction in righteousness begins in the home by being consistent. Her faith, it wasn't a changeable faith. It was unchanging. Her mood didn't determine how she treated the brethren, and it didn't determine how she treated her children. She didn't get in a foul mood and then go around stomping and yelling at everybody. She knew the standard. The standard's merciful. The standard is gracious. The standard is kindness. The standard is keeping mercies for thousands, but also willing to exact justice when punishment is due. She held on to those instilled qualities like she didn't want to let go, and then she shared them with her son, and he didn't want to let go of them either. Instructing in righteousness requires a consistency, and it also takes commitment. Timothy was warned by Paul about not letting go of faith. In 1 Timothy 1.19, he said, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. When God's child gets in the habit of packing up her conscience and putting it in her pocket like she doesn't need to hold on to it, it's not a good thing. Is she compromising on her Bible time for herself or the family to take care of other things that really don't amount to anything? Is she holding faith or is she, is she holding a good conscience while she's doing it? When she fails to make wise choices or decisions and has no follow through in the things that she plans or except for the things that really don't match God's standard, does it sound like a consistent woman? Does that sound like a woman with unfeigned faith? Does it sound like a committed woman? Does it sound like a woman who has allowed herself to become qualified to teach instruction in righteousness? No. This word for holding in 1 Timothy 1.19, it's not just having something in your possession. This is a holding fast, a grabbing onto and not letting go. Paul used the same word in 2 Timothy 1.3 when he said, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Paul warns that neglecting to have a tight grip on it, on the teaching of Christ, it's going to cause shipwreck to our faith. It's going to destroy it. And then what happens to the faith of those who are eyewitnesses when we just let go? What happens to their faith? Do they see us having a faith unfeigned and a sincere faith? Or do they see a shipwrecked faith? Paul said, don't do that. Hold on to it. Don't let it go and don't put it away. This amazing mom, she actually taught her son the Holy Scriptures from a babe. He was a, that could have been an infant. Itty bitty. And we can do that too. At the very least, this was uh, one undeniable thing that she did right. Of all the things that she may have done wrong or you or I may have done wrong, the one thing we can do right is instill in these precious souls an unfeigned faith. Dirty dishes may not all be done, and the clothes may all be wrinkled. The roots may be peeking out a bit more than I'd like to share, but are we making sure when all the mundane day-to-day -day tasks get pushed to the side that we're maintaining the care of our unfeigned faith so that we can help other souls have unfeigned faith too? Is that our top priority? Are we sure to share instruction and righteousness in our homes no matter what season of life or uh, season of the year it is? Because we go through waves, don't we? Little down times and then huge times where we're just constantly getting handed more and more. Can we be consistent through all of this like these ladies were? Maybe Grandma Lois didn't help choose the right homeschool co-op or the right math material, or maybe they couldn't afford a big family birthday party, and so they just had a little family party. So what? Those aren't important things. If those things mattered, would Paul not have mentioned them in his commendation in those letters? He mentioned the main thing, instruction and righteousness. She didn't have to beat herself up or berate herself because she educated her boy with the best gift possible. Didn't cost her a thing, but it cost Jesus everything. Eunice had a sincere heart, and she could have a good conscience, and without a doubt, she had an unfeigned faith. Her commitment wasn't only seen in what others were, when others were looking, but all the time. 
God saw her all the time. And today's Eunice would not dare to bash the elders, even if her husband had been mistreated. The Eunice of today wouldn't depend on Bible class teacher, preacher, or youth minister to instill God's word in her child. She did the instilling because she knew that instruction and righteousness, it begins in heaven, it has a standard. That it begins in the heart, and she put it in there and made it become, she allowed it to become who she was as well. During the first century, the Bible wasn't laying around on every coffee table and on three different bookshelves in every house like we have now. But they took the time to make sure he was taught the scriptures. They would have had to have gone to synagogue to do this, traveling dirty and dangerous streets to get it done, but they did it. They made sacrifices and they went on. How much less are we willing to throw in the towel for the way they instructed Timothy in the home, it took consistency, and it took commitment. He was taught from a child. He was a babe. As women, we can be awfully hard on ourselves, and we sometimes feel like we aren't reaching the bar. And this isn't meant to beat anybody up. I hope you're doing everything perfectly, and you could come teach me how to do it, because I know I'm not. But we forget about all the hats that we wear, even when we feel like we're overlooked, short order cooks and janitors and unlicensed doctors and pro bono lawyers trying to diffuse all the strife between the siblings. We forget about everything we're trying to juggle. Paul's reminded us that our roles as teachers and instructors in righteousness are vital because the children are being reared in homes where Jesus lives. Jesus lives in your home. Are we acting like it? When we remember that he is there, can we remember to focus on the main thing over everything else? Think about just for a moment this Proverbs 31 woman, because it wouldn't be a lady's lesson if we didn't talk about her for a minute. But we think about this virtuous woman. She's not praised merely for her physical exertion or getting up really early. The wise man noticed that her strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She's not so focused on elections for this year that she's forgetting what's going on in her home. This was a woman who was looking toward the future. She was a righteous woman in attitude, deed, and a righteous woman in how she looked at the future. She laughed at it. She was looking at today. What difference could she make today for her household? So let's be like that, and let's be like Lois and Eunice. No matter what our family dynamic it is, let's look toward the future, looking well to the ways of our own households, and give them the gift of instruction in God's perfect righteousness, because that's the only place from which we can get it. Thank you, ladies. I am sorry that I ran over. <laughs> All right. I do have just a couple quick announcements. I'm going to close us out with a prayer. First, I would like to announce that um, just any speakers that are in here, please be sure to pick up your